Hey guys, this is Austin. And John. And welcome to another episode of the Meat Justics podcast. I, I just kind of want to skip all uh, anything we do at the beginning because there's there's two chunks of meat sitting in front of us. For those of you uh, not watching on YouTube, um, there's two ginormous steaks sitting here. So I just want to jump right into this and figure out what we're doing because I, I, I assume I get to eat some of it. You do. Uh, so I read an article on the meeting place and it was about something called smart tumbling. Now, it's a little bit different than what we did here. It's where they vac seal and then tumble like a subprimal, an entire ribeye, not just what we've done. But in the way that we could, um, I mimicked that. I went ahead and one of these steaks, I vac sealed. I then vacuum tumbled it, which I don't understand why. I, I mean, I guess the <laughs> vac seal is to keep it all together to prevent it from just getting too beaten up. Yeah. Um, but we then reverse seared them. One is just a regular reverse sear. The other one is vacuum tumbled. And I want to see if you can figure out which one is which. Okay. Okay. So as always, this is a reverse sear. I cook them until they're about... Uh, oh, that is so perfect. <laughs> it, uh, that does look very that good. That is so perfect. I cook them until till they're about 118 degrees. I pull them and then I just sear them like a minute or two aside. With the... Uh, um, Camp Chef, that sear station makes it a lot easier, but we'll get to that in a second. Okay, so first this one, take that piece. And I'm not telling you which is which, I wanna see if you can figure it out. That's already really good. Yeah, it's incredible. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have to do something different on the, on the next time I cook steaks. I, I was supposed to cook steaks for my wife uh, on Valentine's and then uh, we were stuck at home with COVID. <laughs> and then we finally did it after that and I didn't want to go outside. It was too cold. Uh, so I tried to do it inside and it turned out horribly. It never I, works. I butchered what should have been two amazing steaks. Yeah, it, For whatever reason, trying to do it, in my opinion, at least in an oven and with a, like a cast iron pan, it just doesn't work the same. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Can't figure that out. <laughs> Patrick was off screen saying he's better at doing it in an oven and a, a stove than he is at a grill. But we're going to fix that. Patrick will learn how to exactly more practice probably should have gotten two knives all right so first things first which one do you think was vacuum tumbled you, you know i i don't know that i can really tell the difference but if i had to guess i'm going to say the first one that's this one sure or that one that one so i that's an intelligent deduction because this one kind of fell into like broke apart into three pieces but no it was this one. Really? So the odd thing is I would call that one more tender. Wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, that's that's kind of what I would guess, but it, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, I don't know. I mean, they're they're both really tender. They're both really good. Yes. I, I, I would assume that when they did the testing um, – on this news story that that uh, we're talking about, they probably did hundreds of different pieces, different uh, animals, had hundreds of participants. Because um, I don't know, I have a hard time telling the difference between these two. All right, so that was the cap that we tried. This is the center of this ribeye. And this is the vacuum tumbled one. And I would say for a center, that's exceptionally tender. Yeah. So you might notice if you're watching this on YouTube that we don't have much of a gradation there from the outside grayish to pink. It pretty much has a less than a centimeter, probably half a centimeter of gray, and then it goes straight pink all the way throughout. On a lot of steaks, you'll see it where the very center is pink, but as soon as you get out of that center, it starts graying off until it gets to the edge. That is the big advantage of reverse searing a steak. What we're doing is we're cooking it slow and low to begin with. Then when it's almost at your target temperature, take it off and just sear it a minute or two uh, aside on some sort of screaming hot, either a cast iron, grill grates, or just regular grates. We have the camp chef. Uh, so I did this. The main cooking was in the, the box of the camp chef. And then I put the sear box on the side. Um, so that's a little... Uh, propane burner that gets really, really hot. 
In fact, it aired out our um, meter. Really? I had it in there and just, <laughs> and it was like, well, lost connection. So I don't know if I broke our meter or not, but yeah. Nice. Um, doing that lets you have a more even cook throughout the center of the steak, but still get that nice mired reaction, as which, which is what we're looking for on the outside. It's that caramelization, um, gives it a really nice bite good uh mouthfeel uh, palate appeal <laughs> as papa soft would correctly say uh but yeah so that is the biggest advantage i i don't even know the last time i did anything other than a reverse sear on a steak um just because it's not worth it this is conclusively the best way to cook a steak they've done tests where uh they've tried it traditional methods because if you stop and think about it you sear in the outsides right you sear so you would think that moisture isn't as likely to escape the meat because it's seared on the outside. You've denatured those proteins, they're not gonna pass things efficiently. But in fact, it's the exact opposite. A steak that is reverse seared loses less juice than a traditional cooking method. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I I can't tell a difference mm -hmm. between the two. Nope. I don't think it makes a difference. I, I, I do think that doing it as a reverse sear though, probably makes that difficult because mm. like you said that's the best way to cook it anyways so it's i mean it it looked like a good steak to begin with it was cooked properly it's hard to tell the difference if you i don't know if you were a more amateur cooker and you just threw them on a gas grill that was 700 degrees and you just cooked them right uh charred the outside cook it till you just get a little sliver of pink in the middle maybe it would make more of a difference in another way. I don't know. So it was Purdue University that did this. And what they're trying to do, um, for anyone at home who doesn't know, steaks are wet aged before you get them. Uh, it goes through the process of rigor mortis, and then it's going to be vac sealed and stored to age. That begin the enzymes in the meat continue to break it down. It makes it more tender. That time that it takes to do that is a big cost. So Anything they can do to try to shorten that time, uh, there would be huge cost, sa cost savings for processors. So their thought was, can we use the mechanical action of a tumbler to get some of that tenderization and cut a few days off of it? Uh, the people who, or Purdue University, when they did this, they said the people that they used to taste test it preferred this over the control group like significant amount yeah so it definitely has a, an opportunity to help there but i don't think you can do this with your own stakes and get any additional benefit from it some of it could just be the law of averages we just tried it one time um but if you do it four or five hundred times maybe there's a difference overall so i think where i'm getting at is every podcast from now on we're gonna cook steaks <laughs> hey you could not <laughs> have said anything to make me happier um but if, i mean for people who follow me just and everything they know that i do an experiment once and if it works or doesn't work that's it for the rest like i just will go with that or i will throw it out and never try it again uh but yeah no that awesome love steaks uh, one of our new products, well, we use two new products on this. We use the uh, Windwood Camp Chef Pellet Grill. It's the a woodwind. Woodwind. <laughs> Wind, Steve Windwood. <laughs> uh, woodwind uh, Pellet Grill. I have one at my house. I adore this thing. I like it so much more than my Green Mountain Grill for a couple of reasons. One, you can move the deflection plate. Yeah. So you pull that off and then it's cooking directly over flames. I did do one reverse sear last week where instead of using the sear box, I used that. Um, it definitely works, but I absolutely prefer that sear box. Yeah. The sear box and moving that, plus it comes with uh, elevated shelves. Like they just come standard. You don't have to buy anything extra. That puts it into a, a whole new category. Plus, I feel like it does a better job getting to a temperature and sticking to it. I was always monitoring my Green Mountain and it was wild swings up and down. Even when it was negative five out here, I was grilling a steak at my house and I had no problems getting it up to temp. I mean, it took longer, obviously. It was negative five degrees out. But it, once it got up to temperature, it stayed there. 
One of the things, this is kind of a tangent, but since you're talking about that, um, one of the things I cooked while uh, I was at home with COVID um, was pizza. On Wait, the grill. you had COVID? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I had some fresh pizza dough that I had got from a friend because secretly I am still plotting for our pizza challenge <laughs> that we might do someday. <laughs> but I have the best pizza dough recipe like of all time now. This stuff is, it was, it was amazing. Um, really? Um, however, so I'd had this sitting in there and I'm like, okay, I got to cook this. It was frigid outside. It was horrible. It was while it was, uh, I actually had COVID at like the perfect time because I couldn't go anywhere. And that was great because it was negative 20 outside. Fair enough. But I did cook on the grill once during that time period. I cooked the, uh, the pizzas, trying to get the grill up to 500, 550 degrees was a pain. And then I burnt through almost a full thing of pellets in an hour. A full hopper? A full hopper. It was insane. It wow. was it it was so cold. It just kept dumping pellets in. It the auger I don't think ever stopped. Oof. It was just sending them in. It was nuts God. how much you use when it's that cold outside. Yeah, that is insane. Um, and then another thing I've been doing with these steaks is we got a duck fat spray, and our retail show manager has been talking about this for a while, wanting to bring it in. That vendor only sells one item, or we would only get one item from them. So I said, every time he brought it up to me, I was like, no, no, no. And then eventually he got it pushed through with you. And wow, am I happy that he did, because that yeah. stuff is amazing. Um, what I do is right before I'm about to put them on the searing station, I give one side of it a quick hit. I reseason them just a little bit, put that side down. And right before I'm about to flip it, same thing, I hit that upside, reseason just slightly. Flip it, and I—I I mean, I'm getting perfect Maillard reactions, perfect everything. I—I I think I've hit steak nirvana. <laughs> I'm in one with my grill, and we are communing. It's May, a spiritual thing. Maybe I just need to hire you as a chef for one <laughs> evening, <laughs> and have you come over to my house and cook steak for uh, my wife and I. And my wife almost never takes advantage of it. Like I can, I can get her to eat a steak every once in a while, but I feel like she doesn't appreciate it enough. So I don't <laughs> want to do it. She's like, yeah, that's good. I'm like, no, no, it's not good. Like we've had numerous friends come over and be like, yeah, that's the best steak I've ever had. I'm like, thank you. You're welcome back. I'll cook you a steak anytime. <laughs> that's all it takes. Quick little compliment. Oh, that's awesome. But yeah. So, uh, yep. Doesn't work. Doesn't do anything for you at home, but in, uh, the subprimal, you know, when it's an entire filet or something, absolutely can see how it would work i i have one one extra comment to throw in real quick when i when i first uh got that news story from you and was reading through it i was concerned that that it would cause um like protein extraction or some sort of issue there so i almost kind of wonder if that's why they put it in the uh the vacuum sealed bag does that help against protein extraction? Because mm. you don't you don't want the outside of it to really get sticky. So if it's not rubbing on itself or something else, maybe it's just taking the impact when it's tumbling and it's it's tenderizing the inside, but not getting protein extraction on the outside. See, my thought on the reason would be to, I mean, in between, like when you got the ribeye, you have the main portion, you've got the cap, and that gets thicker in the middle, thinner to, towards the side. But in between that and those entire muscle groups is just fat holding it. So if you're dumping that, eventually that's going to, I would imagine that's going to yeah. separate. That's why I would think that's an interesting idea that it's to stop the proteins from being extracted. Because it can happen, like if you're vacuum tumbling jerky, you can mm -hmm. over tumble that and you will get proteins extracted and does cause problems later on in uh, the, the cycle, specifically with ghosting. Um, Often what will happen is you'll do your jerky, everything everything will seem fine. And then a week or so later, you'll start seeing white powder or crystals on the outside of it. And it's, it's not salt. It's uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it is something in the meat that when you overwork the proteins, it does release it. So, yeah, that's a good idea. I hadn't thought of that. Um, all right. So I uh, wanted to talk quickly about Edgewood Locker. They were in meeting place uh, for an article on expanding. They're one of two 
Iowa Plants. Edgewood Locker is a, a Walton's customer, has been for quite some time, um, and it is nice to see them growing. Uh, they've expanded onto their plant and have to think that this has something to do with the boom in the processing business that's based, that started with COVID, at least. I, yeah. I, I don't know enough to say this, but I'm going to say it anyways. I think we've moved past this COVID bump, and I think this is the way it's going to be for quite some time. Yeah, I, I do think this is a new normal. Um, I was just talking with my dad about this earlier today, and um, before I get into it too much, um, we we really should have him or Dylan come on, and we should do a podcast episode just about the growth in the commercial processing world right now. Um, I'll throw out a few facts. Don't hold me to these facts, um, but one of the two of them would know better, but I, th I think we could talk about that for like the whole hour. Um, but... Um, uh, this being a new normal, um, normally our peak season runs till like the end of January. Then you start seeing a slowdown, um, from what we're looking at on how our sales have been trending and what we're seeing from customers out there, what their bookings are in like the custom slaughter world. Mm -hmm. Um, and even, um, all customers in general. Um, I, I think what, where we are right now, this is the low point. Um, I don't think we'll get any lower than this, which is actually surprising because normally we should continue to slow down till June or July. Yeah. Um, but I think this is it. This is as slow as we get. This is as slow as our customers get. Um, unless something happens and the meat industry just really tanks off. Um, I think it will be like this for the next few years at least. And, and, and unless, like I said, things tank off or a bunch of new people get in the industry, which is happening. Um, here's some of the facts. Don't hold me to these. I'm going to throw out some random numbers, but we need to get uh, my brother Dylan or my dad Brett on here to discuss some of them more. But um, I think my dad was saying there's been like three new meat processing plants in Kansas in the last like 10 years. Um, this year alone, there's already three new ones. Mm. Um, and there's more that are still getting started up. And we're talking about one state only. The amount of growth that we're seeing and the amount of new plants across the country is insane. The numbers that we're seeing over the last year are dwarfing the last decade. So... That is where I'll leave it on numbers. Don't hold me to sure. those. But I, I do think we should have Dylan or, or Brett yep. come in and talk about yep. more of that because it'd be interesting. Because an interesting uh, thing to find out, if they even know, this kind of all started when people for the first time went to their supermarket, which let's face it, that's where most people are going to buy their meat. Mm -hmm. um, when they couldn't get the cut they wanted or couldn't find something that they wanted they went directly to a processor for the first time said oh i like whether it's this is a better finished product i liked the service i got there more it's closer to my house something um that kept them coming back but another portion of that was large like big places shutting down or having reduced capacity and then that had to go towards these smaller processors. The smaller processors stepped up. And we're like, yep, yeah, we can take a few. You know, we can do this, we can do that. Trying to keep the meat supply chain running. Um, when those big places get back to full capacity, what is going to happen? I don't know. A lot yeah. of what I hear right now, the big places, I mean, they they have a long way to go to even meet what demand is out there right now. So, um once they get to full capacity, I don't know. We'll see what meat. Meat. To meet. Oh, to capacity. meet the meat capacity. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other things, um, I know Edgewood is not like the only place out there that's expanding. There's a lot. There's sure. one of the things that happened through um, COVID and some of the new laws and regulations and bills that have been passed out there. Um, there was a lot of money that was included for uh, grants for small processors. Mm -hmm. That was one of the big things when the big guys were shutting down. Um, so we've seen tons and tons and tons of these small guys um, get a very large chunk of money from the state or the feds 
to uh, either build onto their plant, buy new equipment, do something new. Um, but it, it goes down to the very smallest meat plants out there. Um, there's a lot going on right now. Um, I'm actually surprised you don't hear more about it in the news. Um, obviously, something um, like this article has said, like $18.6 million in new capital. That's a big one. Most of the time, the grants are probably not going to be that high. Mm. I mean, you're talking tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, but $18.6 million is a lot. That but is. there's a lot of people out there doing yeah. expansions right now. Yeah, it's – I mean, you say state-sponsored, <clears throat> really, us – like, well, yeah. yeah, it's all us. But what has to go into um, ensuring that something as vital as the, the meat supply continues is, I mean, that's one of the re one of the things I'd be cool with my tax money going to, I guess, small businesses and making sure everyone stays well fed. Yeah, fairly important. Um, on the same sort of vein with uh, expansion, Hormel has opened a new processing facility in Omaha and it's going to be for dry cured meats. Don't you have a buddy that works at Hormel here? Do you think he can get us in up there? To, <laughs> to what, to tour it? Tour it, sample it, you know, just. I'm sure we could probably get samples at least. Um, I don't know if he could get us a tour. I'm, I'm, Okay. Slightly joking. Yeah, it would be cool though. Um, it'd be interesting to see what a company the size of Hormel, like I think of a, a dry cured sausage is far more of a uh, boutique type artisan artisan. Thank yeah. you. Um, type of sausage. So Hormel doesn't do small little batches. Everything they do tends to be enormous. So how are they gonna do that? How are they gonna manage that? Yeah, be interesting to see. Um, it's always interesting to me some of the the what I, I call like the this I know me too some of the the big boys out there. Um, I haven't ever heard of this direct analogy in the meat industry, but um, beer industry. Um, a lot of people will say, "Oh, some of the best uh, brewmasters or whatever." I don't know what you would call yep. brewmaster. Work uh, for they would they would be like the small craft brewers out there, and it's like no, mm -mm. the best ones in the world work for Budweiser yep. making Bud Light oh. because yeah, it's just your man ho hum average beer, nothing crazy, but it's exactly a hundred percent the same every time in the volume that they produce. It's crazy, incredibly hard to do, but. Uh, yeah, nor incredible. normally you think of the artisan sausages like handcrafted, a person doing one sausage mm -hmm. at a time. Uh, but to do it in the quantity that Hormel does, that's kind of crazy mm -hmm. to be able to produce it so it's all exactly the same. Yep. That HACCP plan is going to be, <laughs> oh, what a nightmare to do that. Oh, I don't, I, I, I wonder how many people they have in like just one area, one division, just for regulatory stuff. Um, <laughs> it it has they have to have like an army. Uh -huh. Literally, I bet they employ thousands and thousands of people that all they do is regulatory. Well, that's probably accurate. All right. So another interesting thing is that in the first quarter, Hormel's uh, overall income went up significant amount. I think it was three percent, but their net profit went down so yeah. first oh, like the fact 10 15 percent it went down 10 10 or 15 percent so okay they're they're saying because of this article that that's a good sign for the food service industry the fact that the overall money they brought in went up i see it as a bigger problem that even with increased incoming money they fell by 10%. Mm -hmm. It says declines across our food service businesses and incremental supply chain costs related to the pandemic negatively impacted profit profitability. I mean, I, I, I get the supply chain costs related to the pandemic uh, negatively impacted profitability, but I don't understand the whole, f how does it declines across food service? Cause they still went up overall. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't quite understand how how they went up, but they lost. I guess they didn't lose money, but they lost some of their profit profits. There. Yeah, because yeah. their costs obviously went through the roof. I mean, part of that is 
with a lot of the processing plants, you know, you used to work and we'd be at a table cutting and there'd be someone in between us. Now I have to be on that side of the table. You have to be on that side of the table. So you can get less people in on a shift. Um, they kind of tried to combat that or some places did by going to like staggered shifts, things like that, running yeah. 24 hours. Uh, but a lot of them were already doing 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that makes sense that that costs would go up. I just, I don't see when these restrictions, when they're going to be relaxed. So I don't see this as good news. I see it as bad news. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Um, one would hope that, that things kind of get uh, relieved here shortly. I've heard a few people in some different industries um, talk more optimistically about like July or August being kind of their time um, where you're, you'll you'll start seeing more events and more things happen that are more normal but i mean that's always subject to change you sure. can see a bunch of things go different between now and then but i mean hopefully it kind of goes back to normal in the next few months but um it'll be interesting to see where the meat industry falls in all of this if um going back to normal is going to change how sp specifically some of the big boys operate um do they go back to normal shifts do they stay what they're doing i I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there's no way to tell what they'll be allowed to do. Will the food service industry ever recover? I I almost think that it, it's going to take years for the food and food service industry to really come back to what it, what it was. Are we including restaurants in that? Yeah. Then absolutely. Years won't even be close enough. Most of these restaurants that are gone are never coming back. And it breaks my heart for those restaurant owners who poured all their passion everything into it. And I mean, restaurant owners don't make huge margins. It's not like they're, you know, most of them are probably living paycheck to paycheck, just like their employees. Uh, a lot of the times it's a passion project and uh, it's just horrible to. There's probably more that goes in, into it, but I always have a, a sore spot in my mind for, for restaurants just because I don't like having to pay the wage of the person that's working there, Fair how, enough. how the, how restaurants can pay their people three bucks an hour yeah. and they expect the customers to pay their wage through tips. I don't mind tipping and I, I do tip well. Mm -hmm. I, I think I tip very well. Um, but I still just hold a sore spot in my thinking for, or towards restaurants just cause I'm like, wow. You look at the prices on what they charge for food, uh -huh. and it's like there's no way that they can't make enough money to do something different here. But I don't know. There's maybe more in the back end that I don't know about. I'm sure there is. Yeah, I mean, you have all the, the cooking staff, you have cleaning staff, and then usually they're in some sort of prime real estate position. So True. rent probably costs a lot. But yeah, no, I agree. Um, I was a, a waiter for a year and a half in college, and the 60 or whatever dollars I got a week from the actual restaurant was, you know, a, a pittance. That was probably just bar money that night. It was yeah. really the tips that kept you going. So I don't know, but sad to see. All right. So on to what I think is going to be the most fun portion of this show to talk about, especially since we just ate dead cow flesh. <laughs> Um, they're back to pushing this lab grown meat again. Now I want to approach this from an open-minded section or from an open-minded place. Um, a couple of things The the first burger that was ever introduced as lab grown was in 2013 and its cost was $1.2 million <laughs> for a pound. Obviously, that's insane and it's not sustainable, but I mean, hundreds of millions, probably billions of dollars in investor capital went into this industry and it has exploded. You've got all sorts of people trying to bring something to the market right now. Um, my, my biggest problem with it is the same problem I have with electric cars. The amount of extra pollution and especially if like you look at strip mining for minerals for the batteries 
from my understanding, that is way worse than what you're going to prevent putting in the environment from burning gasoline throughout the life of a car. Yeah. So it's one of these things that we're doing and we're not looking at the actual cost of it. We're looking at what the first order consequences and trying to avoid that and making ourselves feel good. Yeah, it's comparing facts and emotions. Are, are you looking at all the facts or are you creating your own emotional facts? Yep. Um, and in this case, I don't know enough to, to really stand behind one way or another, but I, I think a lot of times um, things like this, too many people um, just see the emotional side of it and then they don't actually look into the full facts and that's where, yeah, right. things and go I, downhill. I forgot to finish that point kind of uh the reason i brought up the the cars is because there are people out there pointing out that the amount of resources going into creating this meat far exceeds what it the environmental cost is of farming right yeah. now you know of uh animal farming um ranching ranching thank you uh it just i don't know it it, it makes me worried plus I remember Bill Gates as the the ruthless salesman or businessman who, you know, sued everyone else out of business, shut down other places, basically took something that was open source and closed it. Um, and then I see him now being the largest single farm owner in the US mm -hmm. and pushing this as, uh, we might want to stop him from doing that. That seems like he's trying to corner the food market out there. It does get a little scary at yeah. how, how many farms, ranches um, are no longer owned by small mom and pop uh, families or organizations, okay. but most of them are run by massive corporations. Yeah. And I'm not, I, I, I hope this isn't coming off as me saying like there's some giant conspiracy. And <laughs> I just see that happening and I look at his past and I get kind of confused as to like where all of a sudden we felt like Bill Gates has become somebody that we should be listening to on how we should live our lives. Like this is a ruthless businessman. Don't take moral advice from him. Yeah. And yeah, I'm going to get into some rants on this, but, um, uh, but it, you usually when, when somebody comes in and it's, trending towards they're, they're buying up this competitor, they're shutting down another, they're getting bigger and they're growing, um, they're conglomerating. Um, it's usually not a bad thing. I mean, usually, in my opinion, sure. uh, you, let the, you let the free market yep. run and however things shake out, they shake out and they'll all, it all evens out in the long run. However, the biggest thing that concerns me is a lot of these areas are just chocked full of so much regulation and then they keep getting more regulated that you get bigger and bigger like that and you're, then you're trusting on one person to maintain it and be the the authority the voice and reason to everything and the only reason they are is because it's no longer possible for other people to enter that market yep um so that's where the free market then no longer turns into a free market and it's closed off um so i don't know if if it was truly possible for anyone to go out there start up a company to make lab grown meat, you know, I'd sure I'd support it. On the other hand, am I going to eat it? I don't think I'm going to eat it. I, it does scare me and concern me a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, I'd rather eat Lucy, the cow over there. Um, yeah, <laughs> like yeah. to be honest, 100%. Uh, but you know, in the long term, if it, if it proves that it's worth it and it can be done, I would eat it, yeah. but I'm not going to be the first person to jump on that bandwagon. Okay. So <clears throat> let's look at lab grown meat from like the possible advantages. Number one, what if they can, I, I mean, right now, unfortunately, there's a lot of cuts on a, a cow or a pig that people kind of don't want, right? That probably goes to waste. If they can make just straight ribeyes, like all the steak they make, taste just like the cap of a ribeye or a filet. I mean, that's a huge advantage, right? It's also going to prevent the killing of 6.5 billion land animals a year. That doesn't bother me though. Hold on. So from a, uh, you know, a happy, fuzzy 
feelings perspective, that's a, a good thing. So those are the two, how I see it, like main advantages of it. But let's look at what's going to happen when all they're creating are prime cuts, ribeyes, you know, hangers, things like that. Well, the only reason we started making sausage was because we had to find a way to use all of those trimmings. It's yeah, true. And now, you know, you're going to just take away sausage from people. That's not going to work, not going to happen. So now you're not going to be able to concentrate on just making ribeyes and whatever. You're going to have to start doing other things. Uh, you're going to have to come up with cuts specifically for sausage. You're going to have to have a fat content. And with what you said, where, what do you do with those animals? You're yeah. just going to let them all go? You're going to have huge herds running through the middle of the U.S. again? No, you're going to slaughter them. Yeah. On the other hand, if we have a surplus and it becomes cheap to produce ribeyes and like better quality cuts like that, mm -hmm. um, what if that's what we then use to make sausage? How great would it be if, uh, let's say, I don't know, uh, most sausage I'd say is more, more pork, mm -hmm. say it was more like bacon, something with a lot of flavor. Um, what if you got to make all your sausage out of bacon? But instead of it being 70% fat, you could get it so it was bacon in like a 70-30 protein to lean ratio. Okay. It was it was cheap enough because they can produce whatever they want, but you get to use that good cut then in sausage. How I think I can prove that that's <clears throat> not going to make a difference. Do you remember when we did or when you had your brother-in-law in, on here, the rancher or mm -hmm. the cowboy, and we made Wagyu and normal burgers, and we yeah. all chose the wrong one as yeah. what the Wagyu is. I don't think necessarily the cut of meat you use is going to have that big of a, a an effect. However, since Waltons would pay for this, I am willing <laughs> to make some some sort of beef broth out of all just chuck and ribeyes and see if we can tell the difference. It'd probably be worth doing. I mean, we're not going to make 20 pounds. No, 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 no. It wouldn't cost that much to make five pounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just small amount. Of each. Small amount. Yeah. I'm betting that we can't tell the difference. I don't know, because uh, in a sense, grinding is the great equalizer, because mm -hmm. um, you don't have to worry about tenderness yep. anymore. You do have to, you do worry about flavor. So I don't know. We we need to we need to pick a cut of meat that is definitely more flavorful, but maybe not the most tender. Um, Hanger. I don't know. Okay. I honestly I don't know what cut's going to be the best there. Um, I I should probably know more about uh, fresh meat and which cut is going to do this, do that best. But yeah, it might be a question to ask one of the sales guys. Um, yeah, but. I Honestly, I, I would think the my favorite steak is a ribeye. Um, I mean, I really like a hanger steak, but I don't like it quite as much as I like a ribeye. So I would think we just do ribeyes versus chuck okay. and see what the outcome is. So we will have that in a future episode for sure. Um, that sounds like a ton of fun. I cannot wait to do that. I am going to cry, however, <clears throat> when I'm cutting up ribeyes to grind. That seems almost sacrilegious. A little bit. Do do you uh, do you make it so that uh, you're putting steak and roast in it? So it's like oh, you're still <laughs> oh, I did, uh, the salt content would be hard to figure mm -hmm. out. But I bet We'd you have to steak yeah. and roast would make an awesome broth if it works out well. We could turn that into there an actual go. seasoning. Yeah, yeah. Could that be John broths? No, <sighs> no. <laughs> All right. A couple other things. Um, next week. On next Friday, we're having Employee Appreciation Day. I'm making... A, Wait, do we actually have to appreciate you? Not me. I'm oh. going to do the work for everybody. <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to make uh, some of the Supreme pizza with the ground pepperoni and cheese. And then we're going to make some boring old uh, uh, blue ribbon brats <laughs> for anyone who doesn't want something with great flavor. <laughs> but you and I have been talking a little bit about... The Waltons 22 
and whether or not speco plates actually speed up the grind. So I'm going to split it into two separate bashes. I will make sure it's the exact same weight. I am going to do my best to make sure that it's the exact same temperature. So I'm going to stagger when I put them in the freezer. So one will be, I mean, it won't take but two minutes to grind, you know, 10 pounds, 12 pounds of meat, whatever it is. Um, and then one of the grinds will be through a Walton's plate and one of the grinds will be through a speckle plate. Okay. Be very interested to see what the outcome of that is. I'm, I, I was smiling over here as you're talking and I'm trying so hard not to laugh just because I, I swear you can't do something and just like, just do it to do it. You always have to find like something new to try. Oh, we're going to yeah. throw a twist on it and we're going to test out this or that. Well, I mean, <laughs> so I, I manage or I imagine, I know it certainly was nice when I worked in customer service and someone come around with like a plate of brats. You know, it was Dylan most of the time trying out a new, I mean, he wasn't doing it just to do it. He was doing it so everybody could try a new sausage or something. So anytime I'm doing something like that, I always look for like, what is this? Like, what else can we get out of this? I mean, I know that's not technically my job, but I feel like it is kind of my job to just try. <laughs> yeah. No, it's fun. Wacky uh, and weird things. Yeah. I like it. I just still have to laugh because it, it doesn't matter what it is. Always in the back of my mind. Oh, John's making brats today. What is he doing different? <laughs> what is he going to try that's weird this time? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, but no, I just. 2019 was crazy. I felt like we white knuckled a lot of it. Like we were just trying to hang on. Um, and with as fast as Meatgistics is growing, as fast as Walton's doing, we're going to bring some more people in for some additional help and hopefully uh, get back to a somewhat of a point where we can do more like interesting experiments. Um, we talked about it on the live stream yesterday, but one of the ones that we tried uh, activated charcoal to increase the relative humidity of a smoker was an enormous failure. <laughs> a enormous failure. It didn't help even in the littlest bit. But even that led me to understand why I was able to empty the bucket that one time. <clears throat> I was able to duplicate that. Yeah. So, um, you got anything else? I don't think so. Do you want to preview what you were talking about at the bottom of our notes? I or is that just a... Yeah, 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 I'll absolutely preview that. I cannot wait for this to happen. And we maybe we'll can get some feedback at podcast at waltonsinc.com on whether or not we actually do a blind blind or just like, you know, because I what we're talking about here is Taco Bell has come out with their <laughs> chicken sandwich. Um, a long time ago, we wanted to do a comparison of Chick-fil-A, um, uh, Popeyes, and I can't remember what the other one was. We, we had chosen some other one, but we're going to try the Taco Bell chicken sandwich, the Popeyes and the Chick-fil-A, bring them in here and rate them to be able to actually make it a blind taste test. I don't even know that a blindfold would be enough. I feel like from looking at what the Taco Bell one is, as soon as you touch it, you're going to know. Yeah. So we would have to blindfold you and then I would have to feed you. Now, so I've, I've seen other people do this across... Uh, uh, the interwebs and the YouTubes okay. and uh, the video sphere out there. Um, you wear blindfolds. You have like a yardstick with like a clothespin on the end or something. <laughs> and so we'll have London and Patrick on the sides. Okay. And with us blindfolded, they like reach the sticks <laughs> in. And you have to like fish around and be like, okay, hold on. Ah, ah, no, try no. to bite it. But yeah, you. so you don't get to touch it. You don't get to see it. And you just get to chew it. Yeah, because I'm not holding a piece of meat and putting it into your mouth. You, <laughs> I assume you bite. Like I assume you would try and get my fingers there. So I don't like that. Uh, all right. What do we have for new products coming up? We've got the Camp Chef Vertical Pellet Smoker. That's not in yet. That one's killing me. I want to play with that. I know. Ah, I have checked numerous. I Actually, I gave up on checking for dates. Like that uh, woodwind came in so quickly that I was like, oh, surely this will be here any day. But no, just keeps getting pushed back and pushed yeah. back. Um, but I do have to say a lot of my favorite equipment 
that we have has come in in the last year. Now, some of that is probably because it's ours. I just like that better. But you're not convincing me any other retail grinder, Pro Cut aside, because the yeah. Pro Cut 22 is obviously It's gonna, a commercial, yep. yeah. But there's no, like, when we had the Weston Pro 22 in here, it didn't do any better than that. Yeah, there's not a grinder out there that, that hmm. beats ours. No. You could maybe say there's ones that are as Close good as cool. yeah but sure. nothing that beats it nope. same with the mixers that new, the, our new 50 pound mixer there isn't i don't think there is a mixer on the market that is even as good as it no i my i would say sure yeah um, i i mean i was trying to figure it out i've put over a thousand pounds through <laughs> the 22 i've probably put 500 pounds through our mixer maybe a little bit more than that um but yeah i i just haven't had any problem with that and the 22 is our best selling model, which makes sense. I think it is for like most lines. I don't think yeah. the 32 or 12, um, but I really feel like they just nailed it. The 22 that. is honestly, it's like the best price to performance. Yep. Uh, yeah. So our, our Walton's buying guide for grinders will be out probably Monday. Um, and what we did was we talked about the little kitchen number eight grinders separately and then we had all these grinders together and we talked about uh all their similarities like everything they had together then we talked about them individually and at the end of the 32 i said i don't know who should buy this and one of the things i said is if you're doing this on a budget get the 22 and spend that extra money on a mixer on yeah. you know something else it's it's going to get through meat quicker yes but it's not going to do what most people would consider two hundred dollars worth of a better job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm all good. That's all I got. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Um, as always, if you have questions, comments, or anything you want us to cover, go ahead and email us at podcast at waltonzinc dot com. Cool. Thanks, everybody. We'll thanks. see you next week. Thanks, guys. Thanks for checking out the Meat Logistics Podcast. To shop everything but the meat, head on over to waltonzinc dot com. And to get your meat processing questions answered by experts and enthusiasts alike, head on over to our online community at meatgistics.com. Waltons, everything but the meat.